Welcome to another Wisdom Pod. We have Frank Peacock with us today. He is Chief Medical Officer at Aseptiscope. He developed a nice and innovative solutions uh, that we're going to talk about today. He's Emergency Medicine Research Director at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Frank, welcome to Pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. So I'm an emergency doc. I've been doing that for about 38 years and a few years ago, you know, my, I'm the research director, so I, my job is to look into things. And so we started looking into stethoscopes and thought, you know, this thing is pretty dirty. Um, and asking doctors when they cleaned it, if you give them a blinded survey, they all say things like, uh, when I was in medical school 20 years ago, if you ask them publicly, they say, oh, between every patient. Because there is a basic understanding that smearing things on patients is probably not a good idea. That's why we wash our hands between every single patient and have all these rules and things. But the stethoscope has somehow escaped this as not being considered having the ability to spread bugs. And so we did a bunch of studies on it. I, uh, but the first study I did is I gave a clipboard to one of my fellows. And I said, run around, see how many people wash their stethoscope. We found out you're more likely to get stung by a bee than get a washed stethoscope in your, because nobody did it. 4% out of um, 400 interactions actually cleaned it. And the CDC says you should wash it between patients with an alcohol swab if it appears dirty or at least once a week, which is absurd. I mean, that assumes that I can see bacteria if it appears dirty. So I just saw a COVID patient. My stethoscope looked perfectly clean afterwards. And so we looked at that and we cultured the stethoscope and it's a dirty, nasty thing. And the worst problem is even when you clean it fully with 60 seconds with an alcohol swab, it's still a dirty, nasty thing. It's covered in bugs. The same bugs that were just washed off my hands they're still on my stethoscope because I handled it. And then I rub it on you. So I'll apologize now. The next time you see your doctor, the first thing you're going to think of is, where's that stethoscope been? Because they're going to rub it on you. Any good doctor is going to listen to your heart and lungs. That's part of the game. And uh, and you got to wonder, did the guy have AIDS before me? Or is it just COVID? I don't know. And so it, it, it's a real problem position. Um, and that's what we tried to do is come up with a solution to that. And so we have, it's a hands-free stethoscope barrier. You just walk by the machine, it takes a second, now you go see your patient. And the thing you put on there is sterile. It's made out of a polyvinyl chloride, so no latex or anything that causes allergies. And you listen to your patient, and when you're done, you throw it away, and it costs a cent. A couple cents, and you're done. And your patient's 100% protected, just like when you wash your hands. So it's, it's a fairly revolutionary thing. Not many things in medicine are better, cheaper, and faster. And this is all three. So it's, a, it's pretty fun. Also seems like a genius business ideas because it's like a subscription and people need to pay for these new uh, plastic swabs or circles. Uh, you guys have got 8.1 million in uh, seed funding. Uh, how did the business, who had the business idea? I guess that was you. And how did you meet your business partners? Well, there's actually a group of us who were friends and had been developing various cardiovascular interventions for the last 30 years. And we're sitting around having a beer one night and thought, man, we should fix this. We could probably fix it. Let's try to fix it. And so we started brainstorming on it. And we said, well, what would be the best thing? Well, if you have to put a hand, if you have to handle a thing that's going on the cover, it's going to just be covered with hand bugs. So we figured it had to be touch free, which is really the way of the future for all infection control stuff is touch free. Because if my dirty hands touch it, then it's just dirty again. So it's touch free. Um, and, and we thought, well, this will be simple. It wasn't simple at all. We had to have this machine and you, you think, well, you just turn a crank. Well, that's a pain. So we made it automatic. It's motion detected. And then there are all these tension manufacturing things inside that keep it sterile until it comes out just before you need it. It took a lot of scientists. <laughs> it's so crazy that it's so hard, but it turned out, it took us about four years to, to get the machine that you could now spit out these covers whenever you need them. You just wave your stethoscope on it. It comes out. You put your stethoscope in the window and you walk down the hall. And uh, but that is, you know, it's like anything. It's like the Keurig coffee machine that every time gives you a perfect cup of coffee. There were 55 engineers working 10 years for that thing. So the same thing for us. But we have we've solved it. It's on the market. You can order it on Amazon, which I think is just crazy. I don't know if it gets there in a day or not, but it's you know, it is now it's geared for doctors offices and for hospitals, nursing homes and, and those kind of environments where. You're listening, using a stethoscope all the time. And, uh, you know, it's to your patient's safety is the whole idea. 
So it seems you have a product mode, uh, an innovation mode, like if uh, China would want to try to copy you and, and get there faster. But what's your uh, growth tactic to get as uh, in much in as much hospitals and clinics as possible uh, in the shortest amount of time well what we have done is done a lot of scientific publications because be, honestly that's how medicine moves you can yell about your product all day long but if you don't have data to back it up everybody just looks at you sort of cockeyed so we published i like 30 papers on it showing that it's sterile some of the papers were really a bit of a, a surprise for me um I had to go to a friend of mine who's an infectious disease doctor and get stool, you know, poop, urine, infected urine, blood, pus, snot, and all this. And we rubbed it all their stethoscopes and put barriers on half of them and not on the other. And then we culture them every few hours over the next week to demonstrate that it's an absolute rock solid barrier. Nothing gets through it ever. But I mean, that study was gross, but we had to do it. So we did a bunch of those to demonstrate that it's solid. The other thing is if you put it on the stethoscope and now you can't hear anything, what's the point of that? because now you've made a stethoscope, you know, a hammer, it doesn't do any good. And so we did studies demonstrating that the, that the diaphragm, when put over the stethoscope, doesn't change the physician's ability to hear. They're supposed to be stethoscopes, but they use now, which are basically, you can get at Toys R Us. Physicians are wrong one in 10 times because they can't hear. But if you take a quality stethoscope and put a, a barrier over it, it's works just as good as the quality stethoscope by itself, except now it's sterile. And so that's the whole idea is we, we, pub, we went and did all the science behind it to demonstrate it. And the new guidelines we believe are coming out in this quarter of 2024 are going to say that every patient needs a clean contact, which is way different. It used to say clean it once a week, if, unless it was dirty. Now it's going to say every patient deserves a clean contact. And so we think we have the solution. The other option is that, you know, that they can say, well, I'm going to wash my stethoscope between every patient. I mean, and that's, we studied that too. 60 seconds with an alcohol swab, rubbing your stethoscope between every patient. I see 50 patients in a busy ER shift. You can do the math on that. I don't have an hour or a day to clean my stethoscope. I'm working the ER. So, but if you did it for 60 seconds between every single patient, and then we cultured it, we found that a third of them were still dirty. Yeah, two thirds of them were clean, but one third of them were dirty. Which one third are you getting today? Feeling lucky? I mean, it just wasn't, it's not a solution. So, you know, the barrier is by far the best. Second best is, you know, one third of the time dirty uh, is cleaning it. And third best is disposable stethoscope. So your doctor can't hear and misses the diagnosis one out of 10 times. So we clearly have uh, dominated the science and the, and the guidelines are going to reflect that. It's, it's time to, to move on to a better supported technology than what we used to do, which was clean it when it looked dirty. What about the environment for these uh, reusable products, like reusable, uh, well, not reusable, but you change the head of the toothbrush, for example, uh, but all of that goes into trash. So do you have a plan to, yeah, just keep the environment healthy and clean? Yeah, we've, we've addressed that. So there are 400 uh, barriers in a cassette. Cassette's about this big, see my hands here. Um, they drop into the dispenser and it dispenses them. The barriers themselves, single patient use, throw it away when you're done. So if a patient has 10 or 15 episodes of being listened to over the course of a day or two, it's a stack about yay big and this big around, which is a 10th of the size of the disposable stethoscope, which is a single patient use option. Um, ours works that one, and that one doesn't even work very well. So um, from waste and, re and uh, resource utilization, this is by far the, the best solution we have currently. Uh, on the market. Uh, it is, you know, environmentally friendly. Uh, it is the most environmentally friendly option we have. In terms of product innovation, now that you have solved the bacteria or mostly solved that one, would you think of other features uh, that would be IoT related, just, um, you know, like monitor the heartbeat of the patient and the respiration in the machine, have data out of that, and that and then have an AI make sense out of it and detect abnormalities? Well, so you're, you're changing grounds. I'm, I'm going to stay within the infection space for a second here, and then I'll address that. But in terms of other advances, the other thing we rub all over people and doesn't get cleaned very often is the ultrasound probe. Uh, we use ultrasounds, you know, 10 times a day in my ER, listening to the heart. Uh, let's looking at the lungs, uh, seeing what's going on. It allows, you know, it's the ultimate tool for me to see without radiation and it's free. I can do it uh, 10 times an hour and it doesn't, there's no added cost. 
Uh, but people don't clean that between patients either. And when they do, they don't do a great job. So once again, um, this disposable barrier, which we have used on the uh, the ultrasound probe, is, is another option to prevent spread of drugs between uh, bugs between patients. And it's not just bacteria; it's nasty fungi, it's viruses, it's everything. Um, the other thing is we have the same. We're working on this, and it's not complete. But we're working on the same thing for the hands, where you stick your hands in there, you get disposable gloves. Because right now, you know how you get gloves? There's this box. And you reach in there and grab in the box. And so I, my nose, and I reach in the box and I pull out a glove. Well, the glove I got is clean, but guess what? I'm leaving behind for you. And you're going to come up and grab that glove I just snorted on. And now it's going to share. So this digging out of a box for sterile stuff is bogus. It's not a, it's, nobody thought about it very long. It's cheap, but it doesn't work very well. So so all these institutions in uh, infection control and in the, in the uh, medical environment um, the, the disposable hand-free, the touch-free barrier is where we're going with this because you don't want somebody touching your thing before you get to touch it. It's just not right. So in terms of the of the cardiology aspect of it, there's a lot of options going on with that. And uh, um, there there is, and the AI is having a huge ability to interpret. You know, doctors are good at, uh, at being an interface between patients and the computer because computers aren't good at that at all. Um, when a you know, two patients come in, one says I'm dying of pain and they're eating a sandwich. The next guy comes in, I'm dying of pain and he dies. The computer can't figure it out. All they hear is I'm dying of pain. The guy with the sandwich is fine. Um, so doctors are necessary to be that interface between uh, AI and the answer. But the AI is really good at recognizing patterns. It can look at, a, you know, I look at patterns in ones or twos. You know, there's a elevated white count. The potassium's a little bit elevated. I can look at those. I can't look at 50 patterns. It just overwhelms a human being. And computers are really good at that. And, I, and I've been working on a number of programs for this. Um, one of the things that when people come to the hospital with an infection, you can't tell. You look at them and go, you look normal. Every lab looks normal. You go, you're normal. And two days later, they die. And it's like, I wish I would have known. I would have done something differently to give them antibiotics. But they were perfectly normal when they came in. Um, the computer will pick that up. And they'll say, this guy looks perfectly normal now, but in two days he's going to die. So you better give him antibiotics today. And um, we're we're doing an FDA submission right now for that exact in, um, application because you know those things that computers are going to be good at reading pictures, you know, calculating difficult numbers, those sort of things. Computers are great at that. Interpreting the person who's crying in front of you, computers are terrible at it. They can't do it. Um, and, and so there's, you know, everybody says, my job's going to go away. It's like, not anytime soon. It's not. We, we're going to need people to interpret um, human to the computer for a very long time. And what other ability do you feel that you have as a doctor that an AI wouldn't have? Don't we have that AI, that, that human magic in which we can know something at a gut level from so many data that her brain have computed in the past and we're like, okay, yeah, let's double check that. Or I think this is it. And magically it, it is that. So don't we have that human magic to us? Yeah. So, so, so far we do. Uh, and intuition is, is still out there. The other thing that, that is the fact of AI and, and me and a friend just published this a couple of weeks ago is that the computer only knows what is known. And when you go into the space that is unknown, the computer's in over its head really quickly and they will regurgitate some garbage that they thought that somebody who didn't know what they were doing published 15 years ago as if it is fact and people will follow it. And the problem is, is just flat out wrong. But because the correct data hasn't been published today, the computer doesn't know that. And so it just reports, you know, it it's garbage in, garbage out. So when the computer has good data, it's got a good answer. And when it has bad data, it's in over its head. It's like asking a five-year-old, well, what do you know? It's like, well, not much. He's only five. Uh, and that's where AI is right now. They're only five years old. Now, it seems that it's a humongous landscape, uh, the bacterial um, fixing, but how do you detect those? Like, is there a machine that can show the bacteria on surfaces, uh, like a UV rays or something? Because me, I can picture just people like uh, entering hospitals with their dirty shoes. You know, there's dog shit in the street and... They, they just <laughs> entered a hospital yeah. and then it just spreads everywhere. So how, how do you de detect these bacteria? Yeah, we can't do that. We don't have the ability to scan you and say, oh, you're, you've got some bugs on you. And, and because if we did, that would make, honestly, my life 
It'd be a lot easier because I could put the dirty people over there and the clean people over here and we could sort them out. Um, and I don't know that we're anywhere close to having that because, um, you know, we're dealing with things that are in part per billion populations when they roll in the door and will get worse later. But as of now, um, you know, we're, we're doing studies where we're measuring proteins in your bloodstream to indicate a heart attack. And we can do that through your skin. We don't even need to draw blood anymore. Um, this is not on the market, but we're, we're uh, getting close. Um, and we can tell what it is. And that's part per billion, but it's concentrated in your blood. So, and it's flowing by the uh, sensor. When, it, when it's a random bug on the back of your head, um, you're talking about having to scan a whole human. Uh, we don't have, we are not anywhere near that yet. So we're still, um, we're still looking for what's in the blood. Right. And then you and I, we talked about the architecture of hospitals. I guess it's pretty much like the outdated concept of the population wanting to feel safe from the sick, you know, and isolate them between walls, but doesn't serve much people inside uh, these walls. Now, if we keep this architecture, wouldn't there be like a Star Trek machine in which you enter and it hyper oxygenates the room, it has UV rays and it just blows um, winds of 300 kilometers to you and then you, you enter the hospital all clean? Wouldn't there be such a machine that could clean out people? We can clean your surface, but people are full of crap, man. They, you know how many bugs and, and, and the from problem, the inside too it's not all so like all the outsides yeah, well and it's there are lots of good bugs that you need to have that if without them you're going to be sick as a dog your colon's a perfect example take some antibiotics kill your bug you're gonna have diarrhea for a week and maybe for two or three it might kill you that's called c clostridium difficile it's brutal um you need the good bacteria you know they're like your soldiers they're at the microscopic level but they're fighting the fight the good fight for you and without them you're going to be sick and die so we can't kill everything. We have, and, and picking out bacteria, uh, they don't claim that they're good or bad. You can't figure that out. That's the challenge to this is sorting out who's the enemy and who's the good one. You know, the, you, you talked about the hospital design and, and I like that, that conversation because um, I, I worked in Singapore for a while and they were designing hospitals there that were, had enormous windows. And by enormous, I mean, I'm talking about sliding door opened up, entire wind blows through. Um, you know, they don't have the weather problems that Minnesota has. So there's some environmental options that, that we just don't have. But putting people in a box and closing all the doors is not good for anybody. That's how you give old people diseases that, that'll that kill them. Um, and, and it's what we do in the United States. Uh, we do, ventilation is not, I think we learned a lot about that in COVID, um, that ventilation is the answer to a lot of problems. Um, but our hospitals were built 30 years ago. So we're looking at boxes with closed windows. Right. I mean, there's price issues, there's logistic issues because these machines are still super useful, but we can picture the hospital of a future, just like a wellness retreat in which you're in the middle of nature. Yes, you have the machine. You can certainly picture uh, physical activity, even when people are sick most of the time. I'm not sure why doctors are always like, oh, you limit your physical activity. Um, rest you know there in my opinion there's is something as too much resting and i'm a big believer in, into just uh, breaking something so that it can rebuild stronger uh, in itself what's your philosophy on that well I, i've done a fair amount of traumatic brain injury research and if you look at the history what we used to do with those patients is when they got hit in the head and we're talking about a car accident or you know a pretty good whack hitting a tree um, they're, they're addled. They're not right. They can't think right. They're upset. They're a mess. Um, they can't concentrate. They can't sleep. They throw up they're, they're, There's nothing anatomically wrong. We take pictures of their brain. It looks fine, but they're not right. And we used to say, sit and don't do anything and no stress and no exercise. And what we realized is that people who are given marginal in increasing levels of exercise do better than the ones who are told to sit and do nothing in a dark room. So there, you can overdo it. Um, if you've had a major traumatic brain injury and you go get another one, you can actually die. The second one will kill you. But, but that doesn't mean you should sit in a dark room by yourself and do nothing because that's not going to um, have anything beneficial toward improving your total outcome. And what we've learned is there is a happy, you know, it's the, um, the Goldilocks thing. You know, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's right, the right middle, the, the perfect one. And you've got to figure that out. And every patient is a bit different. So it's up to 
there's some patient responsibility required, but don't sit in a room by yourself in the dark. That's not going to be helpful. What about your Goldilocks, Frank? Because you're um, an entrepreneur, you're a doctor, you do lots of things. Um, how much is enough for you? Because you must be crunching at least 80 to 90 hours a week. <laughs> well, so the, the rule of this is you should do what makes you happy because then it's not called work. If, you, if you're calling it work, you got to think about you know, there's too many hours involved in that 60, 80 is not is ridiculous if you don't enjoy it. But if you enjoy it, you know, it, it's the same as any hobby, some guy who plays tennis, you know, they want to play it all the time. So if, if you're doing what you enjoy, then you should do a lot of it. But if you're not doing what you should enjoy, you should try to drop back 10 and punt and figure out something you do enjoy. I mean, that's really the right answer. Because I'm looking at your LinkedIn here, you ski and me, I, I mountain bike, you know, but every time you go out down a hill, you have strong odds of just fucking yourself up, you know, and breaking something. So what's oh, yeah. your, what's your like, um, risk algorithm nowadays? Is it like pretty high still that you love chasing adrenaline or you're more like well, in the comfort zone? I, I'm an emergency doctor and like most emergency doctors, you know, we all have, seen enough death to know that your turn is coming and you better have some fun on the end because there is no reason to arrive dead in a perfect body. So I, I run a ski conference in Park City first first week of Utah every year for emergency doctors. I rented a helicopter. We'll be heli skiing if the snow co cooperates in, in about uh, first week of March. But you know, I, I look at that as a, a modified risk. You do it with people who are experts. I always wear all the, all the protective gear. I wear the helmet. I have a radio beacon and I mountain bike all over uh, Park City, Utah in the summer. And I love it, but I've broken bones, um, but I still wear a helmet and I still wear the, I have elbow pads and knee pads and I do it more. Cause one day you'll be in a box and that'll be that. I don't like that because I, I want to live forever. Um, I'm a longevity freak and biohacker, but I mean, yeah, I might die. Someone might revive my consciousness uh, if I, tell them to do so uh, one day. Um, what do you have on your goals list for this year? And what do you want to accomplish on the time that you have left on this earth? Well, in, in the short term, I'm going helicopter skiing. But in the longer term, uh, we want to get a septoscope that barrier company launched and uh, um, fully sustainable. It is in a transition period right now. It's, it's just starting sales. So we're hoping that it catches up, takes off and, and does really well. Um, and, and, you know, I've got a lot of other science things that I want to be able to say that are done the, the blood, the blood analysis, it doesn't require drawing blood that will, that will be so disruptive and change the world, um, that we'll be able to, you know, you can wear this wherever you go. You want to know if you're pregnant, you just push the button and tells you, nope, you're not pregnant or you are, because that's a protein. You want to know how your diabetes are doing. You want to know your thyroid, all that could be just done through your skin in, in a couple minutes, just by pushing a button on this little watch that you wear. And we're so close to that. It's unbelievable. Um, it's it's like I used to watch Star Trek as a kid, and I thought the tricorder was really cool. This is the tricorder. There you go. Uh, last question. You're probably saving five to ten lives a day right now as a doctor. With that startup, is it your hope that you save 50, 100 lives a day? Yeah. If you look at the number of people who die from hospital-acquired or healthcare-acquired infection, it's about 250 people a day. It's the equivalent of an airplane grounding in once a day. We wouldn't tolerate that. And yet we tolerate that among healthcare acquired infections. And so there's a huge dent to be made in that. And I think that, you know, that's our goal is to make a huge dent in, in that. Very cool. Well, thank you for today, Frank. Where can people find out more about you? Um, Aseptoscope.com, uh, emergencies and medicine.com, um, or reach out to me on LinkedIn.